first and foremost, thank you all for coming out and supporting our work. Um, working on this presentation for the past few weeks has really given me the opportunity to sit down and reflect on how the last three months I spent interning at Tadamun, um, the Egyptian Re Refugee Multicultural Council has affected um, the way I think about Egypt, the way I think about Sudan, and the way I think about the future of my work. Um, and for um, just for reference, Tadamun in Arabic means solidarity. Um, so yeah, so on May 23rd, 2018, four days after I arrived in Cairo, a human rights activist and journalist, Wa'il Abbas, was taken by police from his home in Cairo to state security offices. He was charged with involvement in a terrorist group, spreading false news and misuse of social networks. On June 5th, 2018, dozens of human rights activists of the Civil Democratic Movement, a coalition of eight socialists and liberal parties, were violently beaten by assailants that accused them of being traitors, spies, and enemies of the state. The assailants are widely believed to be members of the Egyptian military. Post-revolutionary Egypt is nothing short of authoritarian, and activist journalists and those working to invest in their communities in a way that is deemed to be political are branded as enemies of the state and are treated as such. This is the context that the organization I worked with, Tadamun, um, operates in. Um, just for reference, I was attracted to Dodamun um, instead of, for instance, working with the International Organization for Migration or the UNHCR or any of the traditional bigger uh, migration-focused um, agencies in Egypt because Dodamun is run by former refugees or people who have received citizenship in Egypt and asylum seekers. Um, and they have a very grassroots approach to their work and in, 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 in um, incorporating the communities that they operate with. Um, so to me, th that's where Dodamun's strength uh, comes from. So Tadamun is an independent network of civil society organizations that work to promote uh, the welfare of refugees in Egyptian society. Tadamun is essentially a coalition of a number of nonprofit organizations in Cairo. They have 10 centers, each centered around a different project and or initiative that are located all throughout Cairo and Alexandria in northern Egypt. At the moment, over 10 organizations work under Tadamun's umbrella and within these centers. Over the summer, I worked on a UN and EU funded project, Malazi, with Tadamun and the Digital Museum of Women, a partner of Tadamun's. The aim of the Malazi project was to provide a safe space for female identifying refugees and asylum seekers and their children. I worked in the neighborhood of Maadi, which was predominantly Sudanese. So the Sudanese migrant crisis is of the most appalling conflicts in the world today, but is ranked third on the world's most neglected displacement crises. The Sudanese government, which operates on Islamist pan-Arab agenda, slaughters, terrorizes, and displaces Sudanese communities in Darfur, the Nuba Mountains, South Kordofan, and South Sudan on the basis that they, unlike Northern Sudanese, are not Arab, but African, and that their Africanness is not to be tolerated in the Sudanese state. This belief was a driving factor of the first and second Sudanese civil wars, as well as the war in Darfur, and the conflict in, S in South Sudan and the Blue Nile State. As of 2015, there were 40.2 million displaced Sudanese peoples. The Egyptian Initiative for Personal Rights estimates that there are between two to five million Sudanese refugees and migrants in Egypt. Um, furthermore, Sudanese refugees oftentimes find themselves dealing with the same racial discrimination they face in Egypt, making it difficult, if not impossible, to make a home out of Egypt. Their existence in Egypt is complicated by the relationship between Egypt and Sudan. Sudan was an Ottoman Egyptian and Anglo-Egyptian colony on and off between, oops, on and off between 1821 and, eight and 1956. Egypt and Arab Sudanese slave traders raided the western and southern parts of Sudan to fuel the slave labor market in northern Sudan and Egypt. This has had lasting consequences on the ways in which non-Arab Sudanese are treated on an institutional level in Cairo. My argument here is that the present um, interactions between the political spheres in both Egypt and Sudan relate to, as relate to the conflict as much as the historical um, complexities of it. Um, today, Egypt and Sudan have what I would call a complicated but brotherly relationship in that, for instance, uh, the Sudanese government is run by a hostile party uh, or considered a hostile party by the Egyptian state, but at the same time, there exist things like the Four Freedoms Agreement, which allows Sudanese and Egyptians to move back and forth, in theory, allow Sudanese and Egyptians to move between both countries and receive education in both, um, as well as free health care. Um, just excuse me really fast. Okay. Um, and yeah. Um, and this is a clip that I took from a show that was running in Egypt this summer. It, did, it was a show about a Sudanese family that worked under uh, an Egyptian boss and his, and his family. Um, and this is an Egyptian man in blackface. And the Sudanese characters were portrayed with having a, a bad Arabic accent. With they kept calling the Egyptian boss Sidi, which means master in Arabic. Um, so 
Sudanese people in the Egyptian national psyche exist as the other that defines what an Egyptian is. And so the ways in which Sudanese are codified and racialized in, in, in Egypt is very much predicated on the fact that they are considered subservient. Um, so that obviously, given the nature of the history of the slave trade in Egypt and in Sudan, this has deep, deeply informed how refugees are able to exist and live in Sudan. Um, for reference, um, not all Sudanese people are Arab or identify as Arab. There are a multiplicity of tribes and ethnicities in Sudan. Northern Sudanese oftentimes uh, um, consider themselves to be Nubian or, or Arab and operate, uh, I would argue, more easily in Egypt than uh, those from the West and the South do. I myself identify as Northern Sudanese, and I am legacy to a violent history of owning slaves in my own family and my own family being hostile to Western and Southern Sudanese. So this very much informed the way I operated in the work that I did this summer because a lot of people that I interacted with were, f were from the West and the South. So a lot of m the emotional burden of like having to work in this space was grappling with the fact that I come from a very privileged background, not only being an American, but also a Northern Sudanese. So then who am I to come into this space and navigate it and help people in, in the ways in which I tried to help them? Um, so it's something that I've been thinking about in terms of my own positionality and something that I, I've continued to think about throughout my work with Tadamun. Um, okay. So refugees exist at the violent intersection of Sudan and Egypt's relationship. Um, over the summer, this past summer that I was working with at uh, a document leaked from the Sudanese embassy which named 48 refugees that were wanted by the Sudanese government for being dissidents of the state. And dissident is largely um, categorized in Sudan. It's anything from protesting or just writing something online to criticizing the state. Um, and so the, 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 the list of, this re of these refugees was sent to the Egyptian consulate. Uh, the Egyptian consulate s forwarded this to the Egyptian national security state. Um, and they contacted the refugees and made it so that they promised not to contact the UNHCR and, and left the state and moved back to Sudan to face the consequences of their political activism as it was defined. Um, and this happened to a number of refugees, some of whom uh, worked, uh, um, sorry, came to Tadamun and uh, asked for our sources or asked for our resources. Um, and, and they they came with these harrowing stories of the police coming to their doors and asking them to leave the state and offered them no protection in terms of the UNHCR or the state. So there's a qu there's a large cooperation between the Sudanese government and the Egyptian state in terms of the Sudanese state demanding that people be deported to Sudan and tried there for political um, dissidents and the Egyptian state complying. So it's very much so that these refugees exist in a sort of second Sudan in the sense that they leave Sudan but are very much subject to the whims of the Sudanese government in the context of Egypt. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned before, um, the Egyptian Personal Initiative for Human Rights um, estimates that there are between, uh, there's around 750,000 to 4 million Sudanese refugees, migrants, and asylum seekers. This number is really big just because of the fact that not a lot of Sudanese people have papers. Um, just for reference, in Sudan, a lot of the administra administrative centers are located in Khartoum, which is the capital of the country, but these are largely inaccessible to people in the west or the south. And also, in a lot of cases, um, certain tribes are not allowed to register for passports or for documents. If you go to Sudan today and you register, for instance, for a green card or for a passport, if you mark that you're from a certain tribe, you will be denied a passport on the basis that you don't qualify as a Sudanese person. So a lot of people are made intentionally stateless by, intentionally stateless by the state itself. So this, uh, ver this is why um, the numbers are so varied. Um, and so, yeah. And so two particular incidents, I think, epitomize the, vi the violent nature of the relationship between Sudanese refugees and the Egyptian state, the first being the Black Days of January 27th to 29th um, in 2003. And this refers to Operation Kick the Black kick the black blacks out this was this is translated from Arabic so that's why it sounds a little wonky I mean it is a little wonky regardless um, so yeah this refers to an initiative by the Egyptian police where they decided to round up all of the blacks and by blacks they meant Sudanese people they could find in the neighborhood of Maadi which is predominantly Sudanese round them up and they interrogated them for days on end and if they were found to have insufficient papers which because of the reasons that I mentioned was a lot of them um, they were deported to Sudan and over 200 people were arrested and 100 were deported um, and a lot of them were beaten to death um, I think it was around 15 that were beaten to death and then the Mustafa Mahmoud Park massacre, which happened in December 30th, 2005, is yet another example of the violent nature of the relationship between the Sudanese and Egyptian governments. Um, so this to over 2,000 Sudanese people camped outside of the UNHCR um, it would in, it at the Mustafa Mahmoud Park. 
and were protesting the, UNH the UNHCR's inability uh, to recognize the fact that Sudanese people were suffering to a degree that they couldn't accommodate. Um, and so three months into the, the camping out, the Egyptian police came out and forced everybody to leave and at the time beat almost 200 people to death and deported the lot I think that they couldn't beat to death. Um, and so and the UNHCR justified both of these acts as routine and so it was very it was, it was made very clear to the Sudanese refugees and to the su larger Sudanese community that the UNHCR and organizations like the IOM weren't reliable in terms of protecting them against the state and it's a valid point because the things like UNHCR and the IOM are only allowed to exist in Egypt because of the fact that the government allows them to stay there. Things like Talam would have more leeway in what they do because it, they're more of a grassroots activist-based organization that isn't determined by the state's whims and what the state is al allows them to do. Um, which is why I think so. there's so a lot more trust from what I found between Sudanese refugees, at least those that came to the Talamun centers, um, uh, between Sudanese refugees and Tadamun uh, versus Sudanese refugees and the IOM or the UNHCR. But I'll get into that a bit later. Okay, yeah, so Tadamun's intervention. So here I'll talk more about the Malazi project and what Tadamun intended to do with the project. So uh, like I mentioned before, Malazi was geared towards Sudanese, a female identifying um, Sudanese refugees and migrants in the Maadi uh, district of Cairo, which is in southern Cairo. And Maadi is an interesting place because half of it is dedicated to expats and then half of it is dedicated to refugees. There's actually like a train track that marks where the, um, marks where the, the racial lines are drawn. Um, and a lot of Egypt is like that in terms of like how wealth and race is distributed. And so Tadamun had a center there where they had a lawyer, a doctor, and a psychosocial therapist on hand to basically have open clinics for women who signed up and um, needed the programs and there were there were classes for their students um, and so that one made an effort um, to have classes and uh, English and Arabic classes for students just because of the rising the increasing amounts of violence that Sudanese students face in Egyptian schools there were cases where some Sudanese students were kidnapped um, and sold into slavery in eastern in eastern Egypt there were some cases where mothers who picked up their sons or daughters by taxi drivers were then driven off to somewhere else and their kidneys or other parts of their bodies were stolen so a lot of like the institutions that existed in Egypt that were technically for everybody weren't safe so to that intervened in that sense in creating these spaces um, and, and so in this second picture this was actually an event that was done by the IOM and Tadamun and in this case um, this is I think how I saw the ways in which things like the IOM and these like bigger bu bureaucratic organizations look to Tadamun and organizations like Tadamun for some sort of legitimacy because the IOM and the UNHCR had no credibility among communities so they whenever they did events on their own they were never able to rally people or convince them that the resources were for them but once Tadamun got in um, and brought in like the communities that they had built trust with the IOM sort of grounded its sustainability or not sustainability um, legitimized itself in this in this way um, and Another point with Malazi, so as I mentioned before, it was a UN and EU funded project, but uh, so the EU sent an 80,000 euro grant to Tadamun, but the Egyptian state found that Tadamun was purchasing weapons, which was obviously not true. Um, so the money was blocked for a while and it still is blocked. So a lot of my summer was spent trying to navigate how to get this money from other places just because the Egyptian state found that the Daman wasn't eligible to receive this money from a foreign source. Um, so I, that's the downside with things like the Daman in terms of it being a grassroots active, uh, activist organization. Um, they don't have the political agency to navigate the state um, and are very much liable to the state's whims and inability to or desire to not care for it and allow it to, ma to maintain itself. Oh yeah, here's some more pictures from uh, the IOM. This is from 2016. But yeah, so the IOM and Tadamun have a long history of working together. Although I think after this year, um, Tadamun may uh, not work with them anymore just because I think the IOM's sort of encroachment onto Tadamun's and exploitation of Tadamun's resources has hit a fan. Um, this is another project I work on. I worked on over the summer. This was earlier in the summer. One thing that we noticed in the organization was a l it was a lack of data on the refugees that we serviced and uh, like the refugees in general. So we created a long Google Doc of things that we needed to address with the, with the communities. 
Um, and the goals of these were not to not only find out what our communities needed, but how the community could serve itself. So half of the, the Google Doc was was dedicated to figuring out what people needed, but also what people could contribute to the community. So it was very much uh, engaging with the community, allowing the, allowing the community to engage with one another and empower one another. So these centers were not just doctors and lawyers and psychosocial therapists coming around and telling these people what they needed, but also these community members working with one another to build a community and a safe space for themselves. Um, so Tadamun was very intervened. I think Tadamun's logic was very much to intervene in the spaces that they could and then also bridge the gaps between the communities that they felt uh, they were able to. Um, and yeah, so these are just things that um, I'm still reflecting on and that I was reflecting on throughout my summer. Um, just like I think I touched a bit on like the changing political climate. I wish I could go into it, but that's I'll leave that for a thesis. Um, and its effect on Sudanese refugees. But um, I think I, I forgot to mention this one instance. But last two summers ago, the Sudanese president made a comment about the Egyptian president, and this led to a backlash. Um, and a lot of Sudanese refugees were deported. A lot of visa restrictions were enabled at the airports that didn't allow Sudanese people to enter. So. One thing that I, I that kept coming up throughout the summer was how to deal with these changing political climates and on these reflects on, and their effects on Sudanese refugees and how to be as flexible as possible in working with two very hostile and I don't have a polite word to say states um, and and how to navigate that um, and then also as I mentioned before just thinking about my own positionality and its impact on my work there are a lot of times when I entered these spaces and I was working in a capacity of the logistical stuff and like writing grants and translating things but also working with these people and like communicating with them just because I am able to speak Arabic um, and English and so so I found in a lot of times there was a sense of trust between me and these communities because I am also Sudanese but uh, but that trust was limited by the fact that I am also an American I'm from and I'm from northern Sudan so in a lot of instances I felt like an outsider because because the people that ran to Lamwood were all from a refugee background and were all from similar backgrounds to the people they are working with. So it just got me thinking about how I could better myself in terms of being there for the community, given my positionality and, and like how my racial and ethnic identity um, sort of took up space in rooms that I, uh, that I entered. Um, and so that's one thing that I've always grappled with my whole life, just thinking about being in Northern Sudanese and ha carrying that privilege in Sudan and outside of it. Um, and, and, get and thinking about human rights work, I think it's just critical to think about the ways in which identities take up these spaces and how best we can navigate them. Um, and yeah. And another thing I was thinking about was ab about who is doing this work and who can be doing this work. Um, at the airport, I, like thankfully I was able to get through, but I, like, I was interrogated for a while because I had entered spaces that were, de that were deemed political and my, my name was flagged. And because I am Sudanese and because I am, Amer I am an American, two very hostile identities according to the Egyptian state, um, I was interrogated and I was surveilled by the state. And so there's this, there seems to be so many caps, or I felt a lot of caps from all ends. Um, in terms of what I was able to do because of who I am. So it, it just feels like a lot at the end of the summer, it just felt like I was sort of, I had reached this boiling point of not being able to do anything because of who I am. Um, and that leads to the question of if not me, a Sudanese person who has a Sudanese passport and speaks Arabic and has lived in Egypt before and has lived in other Arab countries before, then who else? Like who else is going to be left to do this work? Um, and yeah, and I think I take for granted what activism can look like just because of the flexibility of it in New York and what it's, uh, what I've, been able to do in New York, um, but seeing that manifest in the authoritarian state and how it's it's allowed to exist and not exist in the authoritarian state has really changed my understandings of it. Um, I think at the end of the summer, I was just really exhausted in terms of feeling put down by everything and not even having money that was approved by the EU come through. Um, so it's just thinking about the limits of grass grassroots activism and envisioning a a sort of realistic and feasible space in which it can exist in the context of the authoritarian state, but also a state that is rapidly changing and is in, in going in going through its own um, complexities and, chang and changing as much as it uh, changing as much as it is. Um, so yeah, I don't know. These are s all still questions that I'm grappling with and thinking about. But the summer has sort of grounded them more in practical work and in the praxis of the work that I did. Um, but yeah, th I just yeah, I want to echo all the thank yous that were given in the beginning and to my boss Fatima Saeed. Um, and yeah, thank you all for listening in.